So this week, my subscriber count has gone up to uh, 66,000 and pass all the way to 66,700. And so as it was 66,600 and something, I started to get the inevitable comments about 666 and how, you know, oh, his subscribers is 666. And so I thought, hey, why not? It seems like it would be a good opportunity to, uh, to do a video on the, uh, the number of the beast, 666. Now, of course, I will not be able to completely exhaust the meaning. The book of Revelations is an extremely dense book and there's so much going on in it that I can't be able to exhaust what is there regarding the beast and the antichrist and the two beasts and the and the prostitute and all there's so much going on but so i'll try to to be a little dense in terms of stay within the subject of 666 and say as much as i can knowing that whatever it is that i say here is not the final word on anything This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. So one of the reasons why it's interesting to look at uh, the number of the beast, 666, in terms of symbolism, is there are a lot of things we can get from it. One of the things is we can get a lesson on how to do symbolic interpretation and how symbolism affects the world, let's say. <clears throat> and so if you want to understand 666, the way, the best way to do it is to go back and to look at where the number appears in the Old Testament or in other places in the Bible, and then you can see if there's a pattern among the different places where these numbers appear, and it can help you understand what 666 is referring to. And so another way to do it is also to look into the church fathers. And so the one of the several of the early church fathers, especially St. Irenaeus of Lyon and uh, St. Hippolytus of Rome, discussed this, the Antichrist and uh, the... Uh, notion of 666, what it could mean. And they follow the same pattern. So what they do in their text is go back into scripture and try to see where some of these patterns occur, where there are similar occurrences. So to help them understand 666. Now, one of the things at the outset that it's important to talk about is one of the, one of the things I've told you before is that symbolism acts as a kind of, let's say, as the pattern of reality, sometimes what happens is you get variation on the edges. And what, with time, the variations tend to snap back to the pattern. So sometimes you'll see modifications in stories or, you're, or you'll see specifications which are there to bring the pattern back or to emphasize the regularity of the pattern. That seems to be what apocryphal writing does, for example, where if in a story there is a basic pattern in the Bible and the pattern is there, but it might not be crystal clear for those who don't see these things, apocryphal stories later will emphasize some aspect, will add some details to help you understand, for example, that if in the uh, when Christ was born, it says it only said that he was laying in a manger. Now that is an important symbol, but in very very early traditions, it says that he that the manger was in a cave and the stable was a cave. And so it's like okay, you have to understand the manger manger in relationship to the cave <clears throat> and to the ass and ass and the ox, which are not mentioned in scripture, but which are there in tradition. And all of those patterns are there in the manger, but adding these details on the side, giving us details on the side, help us to understand what is already there in the text. Now, one of the things that happens for, happened, for example, at the beginning of Christianity is that there were actually two textual traditions about this number of the beasts and revelations. One, some text read 616 and some other text read 666, 666. And what happens is St. Irenaeus of Lyon tells us, he says, no, what is preferable is 666. This is the, this is the real tradition. And what it does is it snaps the pattern back 
into place. And so when now you look at the number 666, it can help you understand what is re- what it's referring to in terms of the, the number of the beast. Why that number in particular? Why is that number so important? Um, there are many modern interpreters who want to relate the, uh, the, the, the number 616 and 666 to Emperor uh, Nero. And I think there's some relevance to that. Like it's not completely irrelevant to think of it that way, but we have to be careful not to reduce things to that as well. Um, you see, it's interesting in Irenaeus, I think it's in Hypolit- St. Hippolytus of Rome where he talks about partial accomplishments of a prophecy. And then he says, there might have been partial accomplishments of prophecies in the past, but then there'll be the fullness of the accomplishment in the future. You can understand that as here's the pattern and there are manifestations of this pattern and then there will be a final total revelation of the pattern in the end when, when everything comes together in the end. So so let's look at uh, 666 and what makes it so interesting. In the scriptures, what it talks about is that the, uh, the, the beast will, there are two beasts. There's a beast which comes out of the sea and there's a beast which comes out of the earth and the beast which comes out of the sea is like a more powerful beast. I'm not going to go into all the details. The beast which comes out of the earth is like a secondary beast. But the, the secondary beast of the earth is wants everybody to worship the first beast and creates an image of the first beast and breathes life into this image and makes the image speak. And that convinces everybody. Everybody is impressed. And those who don't worship this image of the beast uh, they're, 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 they're punished, they're killed. Um, and then the, the second beast has placed on people's hands and people's foreheads, the name or the number of the beast, which is given as 666. And it says that it is the number of a man. And so the church fathers understood that as the number of a man in the sense of how ancient languages in Greek and in Hebrew, especially in Hebrew, but you can kind of do it in Greek, the numbers, the letters in the alphabet corresponded to numbers. And so each name would have a numerical value. You know, that's what we call gematria. That is the capacity to mathematically interpret text through the way that the the, the, the sums of the words or the sums of the letters come together and create a mathematical value. It's not a type of interpretation which Christians do a lot of these days, but in the early church, if you read Irenaeus and you read Hippolytus and other early church fathers, they do tend to dabble in that kind of reading. And so the idea is that it is the number of a man. And then Irenaeus gives us some possibilities of names Interestingly enough, there's one name that I cannot understand what it refers to, Evanthus or Eunthus. Eunthus. I don't know what that, I can't really understand what it would refer to, but the two other names that he gives, Titan and Latinus, are extremely relevant because the one refers to the ancient gods uh, that are, you know, pushed out on the margins and were referred to were connected to some of the early church fathers to the, uh, the the Nephilim before the flood, this idea of this mixture of angels and 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 men, which created the monsters. And the other name, Latinus, is of course related to Rome. Now, it is obvious that all of this seems to be talking about Rome. Um, and so I'm going to I'm going to k- take you through the steps and slowly you're going to start to see the pattern. So it seems obvious that this is talking about Rome. There is a relationship between uh Rome and Babylon in terms of the whore. There's also a relationship to Rome in terms of the beast which has um with its seven heads like the seven hills of uh of uh of Rome. And so th- th- there's trying to show this relationship between Rome the beast, also the whore which is sitting on the beast, all of these things are definitely related. And so if you look at the number 666, Irenaeus goes back into the Old Testament and he looks at the places where these types of numbers appear. And what he relates it to is, first of all, he relates it to the 600 years of 
Noah. That is, Noah lived for 600 years. And he also relates it to the, uh, and he says that 666 is, let's say, a, an image of all the, 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 the horrible things, all the, the perfidy, all of the, uh, the, the blasphemy, which occurred within the 6,000 years of creation. You have to understand the way the ancients thought is that the creation last was six days, and then there was the day of rest. The, the years of Noah were 600 years, and then there was the flood. And the whole world lasts 6,000 years, and then it's the end of the world. So you have to understand it that way. That is, there is there, there, the, the six happens is related to the notion of man related to the idea of the sixth day of creation. That's the key. That's really the key to understanding 666 is to understand it as the sixth day related to the sixth day of creation. That's why he goes and says the 600 years of Noah and then also the 6,000 years of creation. So you can see this pattern, embedded structures, we've talked about this all the time, embedded within themselves. Now, then Irenaeus uh, also relates the 666 to the statue which was built by Nebuchadnezzar in the story of Daniel. That statue was 60 cubits high and 60 cubits across. And the, the connection is important because in Revelations, it talks about how the, the second beast makes an image of the first beast and then uh, breathes life into it and asks everybody to worship it. Um, and so the fact that he would connect that to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar is, of course, extremely coherent because in the story of Nebuchadnezzar, the king has this statue built and asks everybody to worship it, and those who don't worship it get thrown into the fire. So we have now the we have now the 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 six related to the six days of creation, related to the 600 years of Noah, the 6,000 years of the world, and also this statue, also related to Rome and to the Titans, these descendants of, in biblical, let's say, in, in early Christian thinking, which would have been related to the descendants of Cain, which have mixed and have created these, these monsters. Okay, so... As you see, I'm trying to kind of take you along on this path to help you see how if you look at the different elements and you look at what the fathers say and you look at what is in scripture, you start to see how these things are connected today. Now, the one thing that makes it difficult for people to understand 666 is that they tend to see it as like this dark, ominous thing as and you see it like in heavy metal aesthetics this kind of dark uh image you know subversive all this stuff but that if you see it that way you're, you're going to miss out on what 666 is because six is the, the symbolism of six has more to do with a kind of uh let's say fullness of creation it has to do with the fullness of the six days and so the full cycle is seven days. That is the complete cycle is seven days. But that completeness includes rest, includes the part that can't be calculated, includes the part that doesn't work, includes the, the, the margin, the buffer, all of this stuff that I've, I'm telling you, I've been talking to you about. Now, the six is the days of work. And so they are related to man and to the notion of the, the days of work. So you can, hopefully you can already start to see, let's say that the problem you could say is that Mathieu in his book, he gives us a, an amazing thing. There are so many things in Mathieu's book which are said so simply, but actually give us some wonderful keys in order to understand how how the world works. Uh, Mathieu gives us the 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 key to the circle and explains that if you use the radius of a circle to measure a circle, you get six lengths, 
and then you get a seventh length, which is not, which is a remainder, which is not part of the six measurements. And that seventh day, that's the completeness, not the coherence, but the completeness, the totality, which includes the fringe, which includes all those things which can't be counted. Um, and so that's what seven represents. It represents completeness. Six represents a kind of perfection of work. And so that is why the symbolism of six and the symbolism of 666 is not a dark symbolism. It's actually a symbolism of light, you know, and there are reasons why, for example, the devil is represented as an angel of light is because it is the pride of light. It is the pride of work. It is the pride of accomplishment, uh, which gives you something like the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, which is to think that man is everything, to think that great reason that, uh, um, that our capacity to accomplish is all, you know, it's kind of like the Tower of Babel. That is what the, the six refers to in its negative connotation. Of course, six is not negative, nor is 666, but the negative aspect of something like 666 would really be a kind of, uh, a kind of perfect system, you can imagine, a, a system which the people think is completely worked out and has everything in it, despite that it's lacking the, it's actually lacking the rest part. It only has the work part in it. Um, um, and so you can understand why it has to do with control. And in the scripture, it has to do with control of trade. And so you have this notion that it's all, it's about calculating. It's about accounting for. And so you have this idea that if you are not, if you don't have the sign of the beast on your hand or on your forehead, then you cannot participate in the counting. You can't participate in the, the world of exchange, you know. And so it ends up being, in its negative aspect, a, an image of control. Now, it's, it's interesting because there's another place in Scripture where 666 appear. There are two actually other places. Um, one is 666 appears in the place where it says that Solomon encountered the queen of Sheba and had this interaction with her. And then it says that the Solomon gave her a bunch of stuff and the queen of Sheba went back to her land. Okay. So the, this foreign princess, this foreign, uh, entity, this unaccounted for uh, entity goes back to her land. And then it says the amount of gold that Solomon acquired at the end of the year was 666 talents. So your intuition is right away going to see that there's a relationship. There's a relationship between the idea of trade, because Solomon got that money, uh, you know, from trading with the, the people from, uh, uh, from Lebanon, from the different, from people from Tyre and all these different peoples. And so you have this idea that at the end of the year, this is what uh, Solomon counted. And that is the notion of counting, this idea of accounting for everything, of a, having a system which is, which we think is really, is, is the totality of all. And so, and so helping you understand that can help you understand, uh, you know, I mean, and people have the have had their intuition about this before. You know, when I remember when I was young, people talked about how, you know, uh, 666 was going to be like a microchip that people put in your hand and, and or your forehead or whatever. And then when you read it, then uh, if you don't have that, then you won't be able to trade. And, you know, I don't, the intuition is actually pretty good in terms of symbolism because it, it is the idea that if you don't have your identity accounted for, then you cannot, uh, you cannot participate in the trade. You cannot participate in the world. So the Queen of Sheba goes away, and then there is just this notion that there's this completeness that is there. And so on the one hand, that is why Solomon was able to build the temple, to build this 
this image of the holy city uh, was able to build the, the structure of worship. That's the positive side. But on the negative side, it was also the, 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 the problem of, let's say, trying to account for everything that brought Solomon into into a, into a, gave Solomon the problem because there are certain aspects of reality which you should not account for. In scripture, it's the Sabbath. In scripture, it's the Jubilee. In scripture, it's the corners of the field that you have to leave for the foreigners that you don't, that you don't want to count. You don't want to gather the corners of the field. You also want to leave a fringe on your vestment. You don't want to completely tie up the knots of your clothing completely close the system. And so the problem that happens is when you try to account for everything, that's when you get this insane system, this insane system which creates a weird tyranny of the exception, trying to account for the exception. You know, when we see the explosion of all the marginal identities, the the kind of... Uh, or the explosion of the recognition of all these marginal identities, what we're seeing is <clears throat> the process of something like this notion of, of 666. And you see it not just in that sense, but in the sense that, for example, you could account for consciousness completely. Um, an image of this, of course, is in the vision of artificial intelligence. And so it's interesting because there are a lot of these things kind of swirling around today which can help us understand the problem <clears throat> of 666. I know some of you, many of you have probably seen the uh, the speech that Tim Cook gave to the ADL, the CEO of Apple. If you have not seen it, it is very much worth your time to watch it because what he, he, he himself embodies wants to portray himself as embodying these marginal identities. And then what he talks about is the creation of an artificial intelligence, which he literally, <laughs> I can't use that word anymore, which he, which he, which he uh, describes as the God out of the machine. And that we have to create this God out of a machine. Uh, and this God out of the machine will solve our problem, the problem of hate speech, the problem of hate in general, the problem of excluding these marginal identities. And so he wants to account for everything. And he believes that he can create an image of man uh, and that he somehow believes that he will be able to breathe life into it so that it becomes this consciousness and that this consciousness will then be put up above us as an authority and will decide for us you know, who is excluded and who is included. Uh, and, and in the desire to actually include all the margin. And so in order to include all the things that should not be accounted for, that should exist on the fringes in terms of of, 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 of this kind of potentiality and in terms of these exceptions and all of this, we want to now contain it all and we want to control. And those who won't bow down to this uh, image of man, to this, this golden image, will not be able ultimately to participate in the system will be excluded those are the ones who will be excluded from the system not the not the 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 not the marginal identities not the exceptions all of this but those who will not recognize the totality of their system that their system accounts for everything those are the ones who will be excluded and will be thrown out you know and that's that's the whole image of idolatry that's the whole image of pride itself is the problem of believing that it all stops here. All of it stops here. And you can recognize that you can celebrate and ultimately that you worship, you know, the image of the image of man, that you worship reason, that you worship science, that you worship technology, all of these things, or it seems like as we look at where the world is going, that we are potentially at least going in that direction. And now in terms of the trading, we've already seen it. And we've already seen how creating this system of, of, of controlling everything, you know, when we have these online banks and credit cards and all of this, we end up having a, a perfect system, you could call it, uh, that, that if it becomes, let's say, 
if it believes it is self-sufficient and it won't see its own ideology, will be willing, and we've seen it happen in the past two years, exclude certain people from participating because they don't recognize this idol. They don't recognize this idol. So I think that that's really important to understand in terms of the, the, uh, the, the, the image of 666. And just to kind of, let's say, support my theory, uh, I think it's important to look at the number itself and understand you know, 666, what is it as a number? It's actually an extremely powerful number. It's actually, it's actually an image of, let's say, it's, a, it's an image of perfection to, to, to a very strong degree. Uh, and there are many reasons why it's that way. The first reason is six itself is extremely powerful because it is, you know, one plus two plus three equals six. And so the first three digits, the very important ones, which is unity, duality, multiplicity, those are the th one, two, three, that's what they symbolize. And so if you add those up, you get six. And that's, so it's a very important number. Not only is it the sixth day of creation, but even mathematically, it has a lot of power and has a lot of importance. Now, if you look at 666, for example, I can just show you how powerful it is, how it's like, 666 is like six on steroids. You can call it something like that. And so it's six times six is 36, right? But if you take from one to 36 and you add them up, you go one plus two plus three plus four plus five, all the way to 36, you get 666. And so if you add all the digits up to 36, you, you get 666 and 36 is six times six. So there's a lot of stuff happening in those numbers. Now, the, the, the last aspect, which when I talk about how 666 is a, is, is a symbol of light and is not a symbol of darkness, light in the bad sense, in the sense of self-sufficiency, right? We've talked about this, the sins of the right hand, sins of pride and all of that, is that, that, that 666 is one of the most famous uh, magic squares. If you... There is a very, I guess, from people who know about this stuff, a very famous magic square, which has a, is a six by six square in which if you add each column, you get 111. And if you add each row, you also get 111. And if you add it all up, you get 666. And so there is this extremely, if you, if you even see it visually, you can see that it is this square, this kind of image of, perfection and this image of perfection of work is what is the way that I, I explain it or let's say co of extreme coherence and so it's very uh, it's very powerful in that sense and so we have to be very attentive because as these patterns play themselves out as these patterns start to appear to us in the world we we have to not look for the the Ozzy Osbourne you know dark satanist who is going to you know be wearing all black and and look like a ghoul coming out of the earth, that is not what 666 looks like. 666 looks like a, a luminous uh, system that seems like it contains everything and that can control everything and, uh, and that has everything in itself. And that is why it is so seductive. And that it is why it can delude us if we're not careful. Um, and because to not participate or to not let's say worship the system can make you excluded from from the discourse it makes it a very it makes it very easy to compromise in that sense and so hopefully as we hopefully things will not get worse this is really my hope but as we've seen in the recent few years even credit cards and some banks deny access to uh, to people and understanding that I told you this has to do with counting. Uh, and when it says the number of a man, of course, the church fathers interpret it as counting uh, the name of the man, but it's also the number of man. That is, six is the number of man and man's activity. And so when we see these human systems that are all controlling and that is when we have to be careful and be suspicious, especially if we see them start to exclude people from participating them because they don't acknowledge the truth of their narrative, let's say. It's very dangerous. And so 
Hopefully this will give you a little hint on the 666. We're already at half an hour for this video. I don't want to go too much into it. There would be a lot more to talk about in terms of understanding the city, understanding Rome, the relationship to the temple, the relationship also to the city as being, uh, you know, this image of the Titans, Cain, uh, you know, Edom, Rome. There's so much to talk about. Maybe at some point I can talk about those other relationships, um, but hopefully it will give you at least some food for thought. And, uh, you know, as we are in the month of November, <laughs> we are going to deal with a little bit of these dark subjects again. I have decided that for my uh, November Patreon video, I'm going to be making a video on witches. And of witches is also an extremely wide subject and difficult to cover in one video. And so I'll mostly be trying to look at the book, The Hammer of Witches, the Malleus Maleficorum, and look at what the people in that book said witches were trying to accomplish and whether or not uh, that what they say has happened or whether it succeeded or whether it failed. So we'll, we'll have some fun with that. Um, and also, after this dark moment, as Christmas is approaching, uh, my children insisted this year that I make a t-shirt, which was obviously Santa Claus Exists. They all wanted one. And so I uh, designed it with my kids and I put it up on Teespring. So if you're interested in proclaiming the truth about Santa for the holidays, uh, you can go ahead and check that out. So guys, thank you for your support. I've seen a lot of growth in the viewership of the channel. So I really appreciate it. As usual, you know, Share the video if you think it's worth it, and I will see all of you very soon.